My name is Jerry Bond, and I represent Ben In Ministry, a worldwide TV ministry that is going to bless you today. May the glory and the presence of God our Father through Jesus His Son by the Spirit that develops and holds and is in us go all over this world. And may the people see and know that God is alive, that He is dealing with His people. He's bringing salvation, redemption, and repentance to His people to restore them to a right relation. May the glory of the fire that's in the river flow upon you. May the river of life that is in Christ Jesus flow into us because in Him we can do all things and all things are about Him. We must come to a place where we realize that the ministry is all about Jesus and Jesus is everything. May this bless you today. May you see the glory of the Lord. May you be in, uh, just His presence will overshadow you and we give you all praise in all things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Father, we just come together in agreement right now and we thank you this is the day the Lord has made and we just thank you that for the Holy Spirit that comes, who indwells us, leaves, never leaves us, and is always with us. We thank you that he's here to minister the message and to glorify the Lord Jesus, that all that would come to righteousness would come through him, and they would seek him and know him as their personal Lord, their Savior, their healer, their deliverer, their comforter, the Spirit of God upon us, in us. The mystery of the, of the kingdom of heaven is in us, because Jesus said, I have come to bring the kingdom of heaven here to this earth to each and every person that will receive it. So this morning we receive it and we thank you that it is ours and it was bought by the blood of our Savior. And we give you praise in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to talk about, good morning. We're going to talk about, we're in Ephesians chapter 2 and we're going to talk about in heavenly places. In heavenly places. Let's read starting in verse 4. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our sins and made us alive together with Christ, the anointing, and by grace you've been saved and raised up, this is the, fifth, the fifth, six verses one we're concentrating on, raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in the anointed Jesus in order that in the times to come he might show us the suppressing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in the anointing. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, but it is a gift of God, and no one should boast. And we're going to talk about heavenly places. Now I want you to move across the page and look at the first chapter of, of Ephesians chapter 1 and look at verse 18. I pray that your eyes might, of your heart might be an opened or enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of the inheritance to us and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his mind, Christ's mind, which he brought about in the anointed Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Now notice this, verse 21. Far above all rule, all authority, all power, and all dominion, and every name that is named, not only of this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, how do you and I come to a place to walk in heavenly places or to live in heavenly places? Heavenly places, Jesus said, I have come to bring the kingdom. Of, this is in Luke 17, 21. It says also in Matthew, the fourth chapter, the 17th verse, John the Baptist preached it. Jesus preached it. It says, I have come to bring the kingdom of heaven down to earth. Now you remember in another place in Ephesians, he says, who can ascend into the abyss or who can ascend into the heavenlies to bring Christ up or Christ down? Now Christ means anointing, power, dunamis, all the things that Jesus is, the Father is. That's what Christ means. Christ means the anointing in us. We have an anointing from the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And our body is his temple. He is always there. He never leaves you short of you renouncing your faith in Jesus or you renouncing the blood of Jesus. When you do that, you become reprobate of mind. Now, how do you live in the heavenlies and what is the heavenly? The heavenlies is a sphere or another universe. If you go to 2 Corinthians 12, verse 3, you're going to find that it is a heavenly place. Heavenly place. It is the third heaven. Now we live in the atmosphere between here and approximately 90,000 or 100,000 feet and that is one heaven. 
from that part to the third heaven is the second heaven. Now Satan was cast out of heaven into the earth and he operates basically between zero ground level or zero surface level and 100,000 feet. He cannot go back and forth to heaven like he used to. He was renounced, he was rebuked, and he was cast out. Now he was not cast into the pit yet because God is holy all the time and pure all the time, so therefore he could not do the, the destroying or the work that the enemy does because there has to be a dirty worker around here, and his name is Satan. Now if you go back and look at Genesis 1 and understand that God created the heavens and the earth, and all the things that are on it, and he even created man, and all the animals, all the fish, everything here is God created it, and all of it belongs to him, it, and the fullness thereof. You can read it many times in the psalm. David knew the expanse of, of the, the kingdom of heaven because he set out and he would look at the stars, and he would look at the sea, and he would look at things, and he would try to fathom how God, between his little finger and the expanse of his thumb, created the, the expanse of the whole being of the universe, how God did that. But God didn't literally go out and take his own hands and do that because God is spirit. He spoke and it was and it is. So you have to understand the things you speak are power. The things you speak can tear down or build up. The things and the way you sense brings forth true life or takes away true life. Now in the heavenlies, think about it. In, in Ephesians 1 verse 9, it says he took everything that was heaven in heaven and brought it to earth and everything that was in the earth and put it all in the anointing, in Christ Jesus or in the anointed Jesus. So when we see Jesus, we see the Father. So when you begin to have this relationship, you call upon Jesus to save you or to deliver you from the sin that is in you, then you want to please him. So what is the first command? For with the heart you shall believe, with the mouth you shall confess, and then you go and are baptized. You have become a born again a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You have been washed with the blood. You've been made holy and pure by the blood. You no longer are a sinner. You are a new creation in Christ. And when God looks, Psalm 103 and 105, God took the sin of the people and put it as far as the east is from the west. So there is therefore no sin upon the people. Now it becomes collective back to you when you allow yourself to fall back into those things that you have been washed and cleansed from. Sickness, disease, and lack of has all been taken from you, but when you allow yourself to get in unbelief or you begin to glorify someone other than the Father and the Lord Jesus, you will fall back to those things that you've been doing for your life. Because as a dog returns in, in Galatians 6, returns back to his vomit, or the pig back to his wallet, so will man do if he doesn't put something in the play. So when you go to Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2 says, We have been set free from the law of sin and death by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So the Holy Spirit came into you and I when we were... We were consummated in our mother's womb, Jeremiah 1, 5. When we were consummated, the Spirit of God formed in us, became the life of the Spirit in us, so we became God-like in the sense that the Spirit of God brings forth breath into our mortal body and has raised us up and resurrected us from the sin that is in us. Now it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Eternal life means God's life here in you and I now. Now, most people believe that when they get born again, they, the rotten here and now and the dirty now is what you have to put up with. That is absolutely false. That's man's thinking. When you begin to realize that you have been recreated, a person pure and holy in the sight of God by the blood of Jesus, the facious and vicarious blood that has washed you and me from that sin. So we are no longer an old sinner, but that new creation, that new spirit of life has been born into us. So when we go forth from that moment forward, we have been water baptized as an outward showing of an inward change. When we go forth as a new creation, we are speaking God's word over every situation. When you begin to develop yourself in the word of God and present yourself daily, with the engrafted word, you will see that you have been changed and your 
whole being inside of you. Now you once might have been a dirty dog or a junkyard dog or a sinner or a bad person, but now you have been changed. You are no longer a murderer or a killer or a raper or a, or a racist or a, a homosexual or an adulterer. You are not that anymore. You've been washed. You've been made clean. And God has put that sin of yours under the blood so he can't see it. You can't see it, but you try to remember it. But if you go read Hebrews, the ninth and 10th chapter, you'll find that your conscience has been washed by that blood, cleansing you from the thought of that sin. So you began to look at the purity that God is doing by the Spirit of God in you and I by every moment of every day. Now, when you see people sick or afflicted or people in sin, you begin to question what is going on. Well, here's the answer to it. In Romans chapter 8, it talks about if you're trying to justify yourself by your flesh, you will fail because your flesh is a direct opposition to the spirit. The spirit person is the real you. Your mind, your will, and your emotions make up your soul, and your soul is trying to find out and trying to manipulate and to immaculate and follow after the spirit of the Lord. And when you get into sin, the spirit of God says, no, don't do this. No, don't do this. Don't do this. This displeases your father. So you began to speak and act and do like Jesus says, speak and act. Because he says, I only say what I see my father say or doing. When he got down and groveled in the dirt when they brought the woman caught in adultery, what do you think he was writing? I believe that he was writing just to, just to show them that his mind was on something else. I think he was writing their names there is what I think. And to see, and he says, those without sin cast the first stone. So when you... When you begin to look at another person in the lesson of Jesus' eye, don't look at it in your eye, but looking at it through the lesson of his eyes and watch and see what he says. What is his thoughts about that person? Because the most vilest of all of us has been washed by the blood. The most sick and, and the most uh, diseased person on the face of the earth, even with this uh, Ebola disease, they, they can be whole and they can be well if we will start calling it on them. What you get is they'll start, people will say, well, they say this. Who says, who's, who is they, and by what authority are they talking? Who's doing the killing, the stealing, and destroying? If you notice, he says, the Satan comes but to kill, but to destroy, but to steal. He can't do it unless we grant him the wish to do that or the option to do that. So when we dig our boot heels in or our spiritual self in and say, the Word of God says that you are healed by Jesus' stripe. The Word of God says that that person in your family that doesn't know the Lord, he is going to be saved. That person that's in your, life, in your lifestyle that you're in working with or around all the time that is not living right for God, if you start speaking the things of God over them rather than speaking what they're doing, then you will see a transformation from the inside out. Then you will see a progressive move upon the Spirit. Now, if you read 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 17, 18, and 19, you're going to find Paul says, flee from immorality. And the reason there's two kinds of sin on this earth. One is we sin against each other and against God. But when we sin in, against our body through some immoral thing, and you, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, when we sin against our own body, then we are sinning against the temple of God. It's where the Holy Spirit and Jesus and the Father live. So we need to be careful that we don't sin with our body. That's like outside of marriage, having sex outside of marriage. And that you can go name all the sexes in the world and all the kinds of sex in the world. But he's talking your body is his temple. When you join up to that, you will join your body to an unwholesome thing. So God wants you not to do that. That's the reason he hates divorces. That's the reason he hates homosexuality. He hates adulterers and those things. And because it takes you and joins you with that and your body is part of it. Now you and I must love those people that are in that and, let, and share the good news that Jesus loves them also and has washed them from that. And if they will speak the name of Jesus over that sin, God will cleanse them from that sin and retain them and bring them into the kingdom. Because the kingdom of heaven is not somewhere way off, it is here now. Because it was brought down when Jesus brought it. He brought the kingdom of heaven here on earth. In heavenly things we are seated. We're seated how? Only by the Spirit of God can you be seated. Can you be seated in Him? In Jesus. If you read the, the whole book of Ephesians and, and the whole New Testament where Paul wrote it, you're going to find that there's 137 times the word in Him, of Him, by Him, through Him, for Him. The prepositional phrases 
in Christ, in the anointing, in Jesus, all those prepositional phrases has brought us to a reconciliation and to a place that we know Jesus as Lord, as Savior, as Master, as Healer, as Redeemer, and He sent His Spirit to be with us. If you understand locality, Jesus was in a local place. He was stepping on the Temple Mount, or maybe he was out in the Garden of Gethsemane. But wherever he was, that was as far as he could operate until after the resurrection. After the resurrection, he was the Son of God, and he operated everywhere. And before that, he gave authority to the disciples, and he gave authority to us that will believe and receive to go in his name. Now, there are people on the face of this earth, good people, believing, and they've been taught that all these signs, miracles, wonders stopped when the apostle died. That's false. There are people on this earth that says we don't go out and witness. We just make disciples. And that's false, even though it's part of the kingdom. We are all called to be witnesses. We are all called to share the good news. We're all called to lay hands on the sick. We're all called to do the works and the things that Jesus sent us to do. Do we all do it? Probably not. Or is there condemnation for not doing it? No. But the whole lot better would be if you'd get up and you would share what is in you. The testimony, just like Terry's testimony about her sister getting healed from seizures, or the young man over in New Mexico that got healed of leukemia, praise God, Pauline. Another, another one bit the dirt and got healed. And all these things. And the woman last night who got delivered, you know, people call for deliverance. Well, what, where are they wanting to be delivered from? The blood washed them, but they don't know how to walk in it. They don't know how to live in it. They don't know how to stand it. Paul is telling you in the Romans 8 chapter, if you're trying to serve the flesh, you're going to miss God because the flesh is directly opposite. It also talks about it in Galatians chapter 5 and 6. If you serve the flesh, you will die by the lust of the flesh. If you serve the law, you will die under the law because you cannot keep the law or you cannot keep the soulish person of your being. Only by the Spirit of God. Now, I had a person that, uh, bring me a tape the other day about a man who preaches, and, and he's partially right, but he's wrong. When you get born again, there's something happens to you. First of all, you confess Jesus with your, with your mouth. You believe in your heart that he's the Son of God, and he died, that your sins would be forgiven. Then you go to your local body or to a pastor or somewhere, and you're baptized in water because Jesus was baptized as an example to us. That's an outward expression of what is happening inside of us. Now, I, I would be glad to do any of you this morning if you want that. But that will not save you. Now, there's a denomination that preaches water baptism saves you, but it does not. It all be, we are all going to the Father through the Lord Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you make Jesus Lord. All right. If you love somebody, you're not going to try to do something that is displeasing to them. When you sin with your mouth, you're saying, I'm sick, you've just sinned. When you recognize that you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you there's something wrong with you, that tells you how to pray. And cast that sickness down and start asking God or start speaking. Let me back up. Do not start praying, Lord, heal me. Start casting that thing down. Lay it down. Lay that sickness down. Cover that sickness with the blood. Your body is the temple of God and there is no place in you for sickness, disease, sin, or anything else. Cast it down. Tell it to leave your body. Tell him to... Let me show you something. When you have something wrong, you have the decision to make. Am I going to pop me a pill? Am I going to go to the ER? Am I going to go to the doctor? Am I going to lay down and put a cloth on my head? What am I going to do? Or am I going to stand up and say, enough is enough. I'm a child of the Most High God, and I have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my Lord and my Savior. And he told me to go in the power of his name and the authority of his name. And he says, cast out devils. Sickness is a devil. Disease is a devil. It's a devil. He says, the blood has washed you and cleansed you from all unrighteousness. Walk in that blood. The relationship you have with Jesus, it's in, in Acts 19 when the seven sons of Siva were trying to cast out this devil out of this guy and the devil beat him up. 
the man that, that the devil was in beat them up and they went out of there naked and distraught. They didn't have a relation. Says Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but who are you? When you have a relationship with Jesus, you spent time in prayer, you spent time feasting on his word, you've been time meditating his word, you've been time listening to what he's saying to you, then you will speak under that authority, under that relationship you have. Get out of here, you lying devil. Get out of here, sickness and disease. Get out of here, sickness. I don't want you in my body. I'm covered by the blood. I speak to you in the name of Jesus and the power of his name. You've got to go. And then you start praying and giving him thanksgiving until you learn to shout, until you learn to praise, until you learn to worship. Nothing is going to happen in your life. Are you going to lift up holy hands without wrath or dissension? Are you going to speak the things God said? Are you going to say what your body's saying? Your body will say, oh, poor old me, I'm tired, I'm hurt, I'm poor, I'm this. I'm... No, I'm rich. I'm in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom is coming and it's overcome me and the treasures of heaven are mine. I want you to prosper as your soul prospers. As you begin to speak these things, you will faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. You will begin to operate under the presence and under the authority and under the power of Jesus and who he is in your life. When you pray for somebody, fire is going to fall. It is going to remove that obstacle, that mountain, that sickness, that disease, that sin that's in their life that easily entangles them. You're going to speak directly to that power that is in you. The power to us who believes, it says there. He brought everything in heaven and everything in earth and put them together and consummated them in his son that you and I might in him, of him, through him, by him, live in that fullness. We can operate in the fullness. Now, are you going to fall off the wagon? Are you going to sin? Are you going to say things that you don't want? But as soon as you do, you're going to say, Father, forgive me. I have just sinned. And you're going to get up and you're going to put your marching boots on and you're going to go again and you're going to come against the devil. You're going to speak against that sickness. You're going to speak against that blindness, that deafness, because they are the part of the resurrected power that Jesus said, go and let the lepers be cleansed, the cancers be cleansed, the deaf shall hear, the eyes, blind eyes open, and the dead are raised. And who are we following? We're following Jesus. Now, it's okay to have godly examples here on this earth, and you can look at them, but I promise you, me and you and all those people you look at will always fail you and I if they're not constantly centering up on the, on the presence of the Lord. You have to constantly be working and operating and meditating. In Deuteronomy, there's an interesting verse. You're going to say, well, where's he going now? Well, we're going over here to read a little bit in the Old Covenant about some things that you need to hear. And this is about the heavens. Go to Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, will you please? Now, this is after the, the, the uh, tables were rewritten. <laughs> Go down to verse 12. It said, Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord, that means reverence. We reverence God. We reverence Jesus. We reverence things they stand for. The, to walk in all his ways and to love him. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. That's one of the commands. And to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I'm commanding you to this day, for your good. So he's telling you to do this for your good. Then he says, Behold, to the Lord your God belongs heaven and the highest heavens and the earth and all that is in it. Yet on, on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose them, their descendants after them, even you from all the peoples to this day. Then he says, circumcise your heart. All right, when we realize that everything that is formed, that you and I can see and know, everything, all belongs to God. But God says, I put that in the hands of man. Man lost it. I sent my son Jesus, my only begotten son, to come to this earth and to retake that ground and to bring it back and put it back where it's supposed to be. So he gave man the authority to live, to walk, to know, and to be in the presence of the Lord all the time. Now, the, the gift that God gives us is one. He gives us Jesus, his son, who baptizes us by the Holy Spirit and makes us exactly like he and the Father. 1 John 3, 2. You shall know him when he appears because you shall be like him. How are you like him? You're not like him in statue or body, but you're like him in spirit. Your spirit and his spirit are one. Now, the more words you put in, because the word and Jesus are one and the same, will be exactly as he is. So you're walking in the same walk that Jesus did. 
Notice Jesus never accumulated all the things of the world around him, even though he had the power to move those things and to use those things anytime he so wanted to. Did he not call Peter to go down to the lake and catch a fish? And out of his mouth he took money to take care of his, his uh, due, due day to Caesar? Did he not do that? Huh? Interesting thing, when he was up, at the last there in John, when he was up on there and he was cooking the fish and the guys were out fishing, and he called them to come up and, and John says, that's Jesus. And Peter says, yeah, it is. And he was naked and he dove in the water and finally got up there. And, and the question, if you want to ask, is how did, where did Jesus get those fish? And, and he already had them on the fire. He was already had them on the barbie. He was cooking them. He was already doing all these things. How did he do all that? Huh? Have you ever thought about that? And then he says in John 14, 10, he says, and the works that I do, I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I see my father doing. I'm only doing what I'm telling you to do. And he said, now go in my name and do what I'm telling you to do in my name and greater shall you do. Then he says, when the comforter has come, who is the spirit of truth? Well, who is truth? Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth. So he says, the spirit of truth is going to talk about me and the father. We are truth. Now, <laughs> I was telling you all earlier about last night. The enemy always tries to bring up things in your past that are not pleasing to you or anybody else. Some little old something you did. You got in an argument. You got in a fight. You did something that was out of character. And then later you hated it. You said something that wasn't right. You need immediately to stop and say, Father, I forgive them and I forgive me. And I washed that sin away by the blood of Jesus. Now, Lord, do whatever you got to do with those people. Cause them to come to the same place I am. So there's not any unforgiveness. Is it time yet? Is it time? Not yet. Okay. So we, so we begin to speak and act like Jesus tells us to do. So when you begin to realize what he's saying to you now, how do you walk in this day to day? If you go over to the Romans, the seventh chapter you will find something that is very interesting. Paul says, I do the things I hate, and I hate the things I do. Now, if you go on sinning, you go on sinning, and you don't operate under the way of the Lord, the first thing that happens to you, you will become what you're doing. You, it, you will become calloused. You have to keep a tender heart. Now, let me give you two places that you can find this. It's in Romans, the fifth chapter, it says this, that the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. All right, when you're loving God and loving other people, you're not judging them. You're not in unforgiveness. You're not in sin. You're loving them. The next place is in Matthew 9, verse 11. It says, I desire compassion before sacrifice. Now, how can you pray for somebody that is unprayable or unlovable or stinks or they've said something to you, or they've been unkind to you, how, do you, how can you pray for them? The point is you come to a place where if you're walking and acting like Jesus, you're going to pray for them whether they deserve your kindness or your way or not because you're looking at them through the eyes of the Lord. All right? Now let me show you. We've been watching things on TV all across this world, and we've been watching how people respond to this. Our way to respond, I was watching a, a, a priest this morning on Fox News, and he is saying that they ought to go and kill all those people that are terrorists over there. Here would be my prayer. Lord, we bind that lying devil that's on those people that's causing them to murder because thou shall not kill. We should, if you're killing somebody, you're, if you're loving people, you're not going to kill them. So we ask you, Father, to send your Holy Spirit to convict the leadership of those terrorists, that's what they are, that they'd get born again. Now this is opposite of taking an M16 rifle and going shooting all of them. God don't want any to perish, doesn't want any to perish, wants them all to come to the knowledge of the Lord. So he wants them to be saved. But if we're not praying for them, what are you going to get? More of the same. If you're not binding that spirit of the Antichrist that's on those people, that's on the leadership of this nation and on leadership in other nations that are causing these things to happen, that's why murder and killing and rape and pillage and all those things are happening and because the people are not praying. Now, we all quote 1 2 Chronicles seven fourteen says, If my people will humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven. Well, we are already under the blood. We ought to be saying, Father, we call forth righteousness in that place over there. We call for righteousness in Missouri where they're having those riots. We call for righteousness in Washington, D.C., and Austin, Texas, and wherever else. 
there's any unrest and unrighteousness. We ought to be calling in what we need to be doing rather than speaking to what we've got. We're saying what we've got. We're, we're saying we don't have any rain. We ought to be calling rain in. Lord, please send the showers. No, in the name of Jesus, we command the, the big trade winds and the, and the showers to come just like Elijah did when he sent his servant to look down on the Mediterranean when a cloud no bigger than a hand formed and broke the drought for three and a half years. We ought to be speaking the things that... You, and you'll say, well, who do you think you are? Well, I'll tell you who we are. We're children of the Most High God. We've been bought by the blood of, and the body of Jesus and washed by the blood of Him. So we have His power, His authority. And I promise you, when you're filled with the Spirit of God, you're not going to take the credit. You're going to give it all to Him, right? Amen? You're going to give Jesus the glory for healing your body. You're going to learn to change your prayer. You're going to learn to speak what God says about it instead of what you've been saying about it. Because we all, say, we all cry out and say, Lord, I guess you didn't want me to be rich, so therefore I'm poor. No, that's not the way it is. You command that, that blessing to come in. You say, Father, your word says that I'm supposed to be blessed so I can be a blessing. How can I be a blessing if I don't have anything? So then you take God to a test. Malachi 3.6 says, go and test God. How do you test God? Give unto his kingdom so he'll get, turn around and give it back to you because men will give back to you. What, you. what you sow is what you're reaping. What you've been saying is what you're reaping. When you start doing what the word says, you're going to find that it will come back. It will come back every time in, in Ecclesiastes you cast your bread upon the water, it will come back to you. And it will multiply. And it will be greater than. One kernel of wheat or corn does not bring back one kernel of wheat or corn. It brings back bushels. Pounds, tons. It brings it back. So when you began to realize that all these things are because of your own not knowing what God is saying. And so we... So we don't know what God is saying unless we go to the Word. We go to the Word. Now let me, tell, let me show you, let me give you some personal examples. I have seen God move in all kinds of ways. And all kinds of prayers. Now we shorten the way of God's hand by the way we pray. In Isaiah 43, 26 it says, Put me in remembrance why I should plead this case for you. Our case. He makes it his case. God makes it his case. Isaiah 45, 11 says, Command God, or it says, Command you, me, the things concerning my children. What are you saying about your children, which is God's children? Well, that kid you gave me, he is, oh, Lord. And so what are you saying about him? Instead of saying, God, thank you for this son or this daughter you gave me. Now, Lord, I began to speak those blessings over my kid. Jacob called his sons in and blessed every one of them. Laid hands on them. Laid hands on them and blessed them. Sent them out blessed. Partake of the partaking. We are to give the Holy Spirit to those. We are to pray for those to be filled with the Spirit. We are to pray for those for salvation. We're to pray for those for deliverance. We're to pray for those for healing. But we're to speak the words of God over these things, over these situations to break that bondage that's over them. Words are, are the method of operation that God chose in Genesis all the way through the Bible to proclaim his blessings, to proclaim his life. Now, you know, you, you try to understand, how can this all happen to me? I'm, I'm zero in the body of zeros. I am nothing. But see, that's what God chooses. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, God chose the foolish things of man to confound the wise. So here we are saying that God brought everything in heaven to earth and put it in you and I and gave us the opportunity to receive that. Everything in heaven and everything in earth, it's ours by the receiving of it and to believe it and then start acting on it. He says in Mark eleven twenty three, he says, Whoever says to this mountain, be cast into the sea, what is that mountain you're casting? Sickness, disease, poverty, lack, no husband, no wife, no children. What are you lacking? It's because you're speaking the wrong thing. We'll go down to the altar and we'll cry and we'll mumble and we'll kick and we'll claw and we'll, we'll curse and we'll spit and we'll foam and we'll, we'll call the preacher and we'll call somebody. And all we need is an attitude of the heart, a change of our heart. We need to change our heart. How do you change your heart? Get in the Word. The Word's what changes you. Prayer's what changes you. Meditating upon the Word. 
So you go, to, go over to back to Romans 8, and he says, if you're serving the flesh, you will be under the, the, the control of the flesh. But if you're serving the Spirit, you're going to walk in the Spirit. Now, he gave us the Holy Spirit to bring that kingdom to us because the Holy Spirit represents God everywhere. Now, you say, well, you watch on TV and these guys pray for, be walking, preaching the word, and people fall out on the floor with holy laughter. You'll hear them hollering, screaming, and carrying on. And, and we'll say, no, we want to control that method. I say, Lord, let it all happen. I said, if you want, you want to do it in my, my congregation, let it happen. If you want somebody to get filled with the Spirit, let it happen. I want it to happen. I want them healed. I want them whole. I want them delivered. This is not a Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Muslim, or Shia, or whatever. We are children of God. That's all this meeting is. It's all about God and His, Him. All about Him. I want to walk in Him. I want to be in Him. I want His presence. I don't want to be without His presence. I want everything he's got. I want to be exactly like Jesus. I want to go, say, do, and be whatever that is. Well, how can you do that? He's not taking anything away from you. He's giving you more. The rich young ruler came and says, how can I walk this way? He says, take everything you got and go sell it, to the, sell it and give it to the poor. He was unwilling to give up earthly things to receive heavenly things. Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3 at night, and he says, if I tell you heavenly things, how are you going to believe? He said, can I go back into my mother's womb? Well, how can I get healing by praying over healing? You don't pray over healing. You command that body to change. You command those things to come in. You quit praying. It, praying is wonderful, and I'm not against praying because praying is part of the method. But the whole point is the way you're approaching the prayers, what's getting in trouble. You speak to that mountain by saying, Father, in the name of Jesus. There we went to the Father. In Jesus' name, whatever we ask the Father in Jesus' name, that means we got it already. Another thing, when you say that, you're getting in agreement with the Word. Because if two or three will agree with what the Word says, you will walk in what the Word says. The Word and you are in agreement. The blood and the water are in agreement with the Word. And when you do that, you walk in the power of that. You walk in the power that brings forth that resurrection and that righteousness and holiness in you and sanctification that makes you worthy to walk with the Father and with the Son and fill with the Spirit of God. When you began to do that and you began to speak those words, you change not only yourself but the situation you're in and the things around you will change and they will multiply for the better. You will change the literally the whole world that you walk in. Whatever world you're walking in, you're changing it. Because the righteousness of God will not go forth without bringing forth that fruit of that. When you start praying for those sick people, those blind eyes, those deaf ears, those cancers, those tumors, whatever you're doing, when you start doing that, you're speaking God's word. You're calling it into being. You're calling those things that be not as though they are. God took everything that was nothing in Hebrews 11.1. 1, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Verse 6 says he took nothing and made something out of it. What did he make out of it? He made the whole world out of nothing. He spoke it into being. When you speak like God speaks, you will be speaking what he's saying over every situation in your life. Every situation. Why do you go out and labor for the things that will not satisfy you? Why do you do those things that are unworthy to come into his presence? And he says, all righteousness. I was, I was asking the Lord, I said, why did you do this? Why are you setting this up like this? Let, let me show you something about this that will make you astound you. Let me find it. I want to read it to you. I can quote it, but I want to read it to you. Everything that the Lord gives me is all by His presence, by His Spirit. Everything. I don't make up any of this. I have no, I've studied, I've dug, I've looked at, I, go to, I get a word, I go dig it up. And I was asking the Lord, I said, why did you do this? Let me show you something. In Ephesians 1, verse 20, He brought about, which He brought about in Christ, in the anointing, He raised Him from the dead, He seated Him at His right hand in heavenly places. Notice that, far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, and every name that is named, cancer, sickness, disease, whatever, in this age and the one to come. Now, I asked Him, I said, Lord, why did you do that? What is your method of operation here? Let me show you. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the, the schemes of the devil or the wiles of the devil. So what do you, how do you put on the full armor? That's Jesus, the word, the truth. Then he said, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, against 
but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of weakness in heavenly places. All right, you've been seated above that already, and you're not dead. You're alive. It's the Spirit of God, John 6, 63. It's the Spirit of God that gives us life. So we are already in heaven with the Father already, and we're not dead. We're taking the message that Jesus preached for 33 for 33 and a half years of his life, he preached that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. The kingdom is here now. Luke 17, 21. Matthew 4, 17. The kingdom is now. The life is now. When you die, you just leave this body, get a new body, and you step into the presence of God instantly. And it says you've been delivered from all the things of this world. You're already above Satan. He's already under your feet. The throne is hit. Satan is on his head. I'm going to raise up the, the son of woman who will bruise Satan's head. That was Jesus. We're made in Jesus' image. So we are above what Satan is doing. We have the authority over that. When you begin to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart what you're wanting, notice I didn't say pray. When you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that you got it, you will get what you got before you get it. It is yours already. Jesus bought it. He paid for it. It's ours. We can walk in it. We can live it. You start one little step at a time. And as you begin to step, you begin to confess, you begin to speak, then you begin to see the things that God wants to do. He wants to do signs, miracles, and wonders through every one of us. We ought to be seeing the dead raised. We ought to be seeing people that can't have children have children. We ought to be seeing all this abortion business stop. We ought to see the race people thing be laid down because we're all made in God's image. That ought to stop. We ought to quit killing one another and there ought to be a great harvest of people come into the kingdom between now and the time of the tribulation. It cannot happen until there's peace and tranquility. Well, the people of God are not praying. They're standing up like this poor priest this morning and speaking and asking for the president to send more air raids in. Well, that's okay, but that will not save people. You cannot scare people into the kingdom. You cannot come up and tell them, say, well, you rotten sinner, you. No, you save people and get people into the kingdom by the love of God. Shed abroad in your heart. I got saved by people loving on me. I got filled with the Holy Ghost because people loved on me and showed me in the scriptures that it was mine. And I just kept seeking it and seeking it, and one day it happened. And boy, I'm telling you, ever since then, I've been a little fireball. When you get full of the Holy Ghost, there is no end to it. Now you have to feed your spirit person every day. I had a person that I think a lot of. He came to my house the night before last and Friday night. And, you know, and he's off by himself way off in another, another state. And he said, what keeps you going all the time? I said, and I just opened my Bible to Jude chapter 20. It says, beloved, build up your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. So when I don't know how to pray and I don't know how to respond, I start praying in tongues. Now, I know in some circles and certain denominations that's not allowed, but I'm telling you, it's God's kingdom and it's here now. Now, you can pray in tongues without being offensive. You know, with a stammering lips. It's not the language that matters, it's the heart. When you yield to the Spirit of God, He's taking you to the throne room where Jesus is. So when you pray in an unknown language, your whole being is changed by the Spirit of God doing the praying. And then your spirit person is stronger than your soul person and you're not being, even though you're attacked, you already have the victory because you know what to say the moment you quit praying in tongues. You speak what the Spirit tells you to speak. You speak it immediately. That's what the, the, the Spirit was there doing. He was building your faith up so you could pray and speak the things of God over the situation that you're in to cause those things to line up with the way God wants them. His perfect will. Go read Romans 8, 26, 27, and 8. Then he says, The Spirit himself makes intercession with groanings too deep for others to pray the perfect will of God for who? For the saints, for the brethren, the sister, and all the people. And then all things work together. Now everybody will take for all things work together. They'll say, well, little Joe or Uncle Sally or the baby died. Well, that God will take it and make something good. Well, it does, and it can, and it will. But the point is, God wanted you to be praying before then that that baby would be raised back from the dead and be have a full life here on this earth. Think about this, the tragedy of the 18-year-old young black man that was killed up there in Missouri. 
a tragedy. The young man was acting foolish. They got him on tape where he was doing wrong. The people that were protesting that were wrong too. It was the spirit of the Antichrist that was on all the people there, all of them. There were a few people praying, I'm sure, but there were a lot of people there that were not under the auspices of the Holy Spirit. They were being led by the Antichrist. So you see, what was that? Strife and turmoil and fussing and fighting and racism and hate and all those things that we do and say, that's not God. And those people that are acting that way, uh, Curtis and I were talking earlier, what about if you keep on sinning? Well, if you keep on sinning and keep on doing, living that way, pretty soon you'll forget that God is God and, and salvation is there and you'll live just like the rest of the world. You can't go to church every Sunday morning and every Sunday night and live like the world. You have to have a reverence for what God's Word says about it. And you need to speak what God's Word says about it. Not what you think about it, or I think about it, or some pastors thought about it, but what the Word says. The Word says, love thy brother as thyself. Are we loving those people? No, we're wanting to get a gun and go suit up and go shoot them or get a stick and beat them or call the law or call the guys to come out with all their military hardware on and blow them up and throw a tear gas can. That will not save anybody. All that does is create more hate. And then if you're sitting down there and you're one of those people that are protesting, you'll say, well, we're just, I'm black and nobody loves me. No, you're a child of the Most High God, girl. Boy, get up off your blessed assurance and start doing what you're supposed to do. Go down there and clean that mess up in those places where they destroyed those, those, those businesses. Go down there and share the good news that Jesus loves them. Go down there and put your arm around those police people and say, this is not the way to kill people. That's not the way. Think about the guy, the young man, 26 years old, who shot that kid. How he's going to look all the days of his life, all that he'll remember about that. Lord, take that and take it from his mind and all those people. And let the good come out of it. Why did I get off on this? But the, the, God don't, doesn't look at... You know, I used to pray. You used to talk about praying for things. I used to pray, Lord, turn the wind. And here lately, that my, Bob Lee's mother said this morning, this is not the Texas pan and the wind's not blowing. I said, you and I used to pray for the wind to blow to pump the windmill. And God told me, he said, I'd give you a tank of water just as quick as I'd have turned the wind. But see how short we pray. We pray little bitty things instead of saying, my God, as big as this whole world, why don't I pray like God is? Bring it all in, Lord. We just gather a big crop instead of a half a bushel. Give us the whole world, Lord. Why do you think they're coming to the United States so we can put the gospel to them? Take it to them. I promise you, where can you find where they come to you any better than right here? They come by you. They come and they hear the good news that Jesus loves them. They come and hear that it's not the color of the skin, the place they were born. It's what's in their heart that matters. What is in your heart today? What is the goodness and the mercy of the Lord? Where are you today? What is the, what is the spirit that's on you? Now, I used to be the same way as some of those folks. You know, if you think it, you'll do it. If you think it, you'll act upon it. And first thing you know, you'll get a thought in your mind and you'll say, boy, that's got to be right. Well, it's wrong. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it is wrong. When you get a situation in your body, let me give you an example. Yesterday afternoon, I was watching, I was watching some, some uh, things on TV, and a headache tried to come on me. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I am the child of the Most High God you get. And the more I spoke to it, the worse it got. And I said, go, I'm not going to put up with this nonsense. I got up, went and got me a drink of water, came back, sat down, and it was gone. I wouldn't put up with the nonsense that the enemy wants to do. Always remember when you hear voices, always remember there's one greater than the one you just heard, and that's the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit talks to you, you will know that it's God, and he's talking to you, and he will put thoughts and tense in your spirit that you know it's God. Now, one time I heard the voice of the Lord. I've heard his voice two or three times, but one time I heard it. I was, I was doing something, and I heard these words within you. It's within you. And I thought, within me? What's, you know, I, I couldn't f assimilate it with anything. I couldn't gather it together. So I began to look into concordance. Well, in John, in, excuse me, Luke 14, uh, 17, 21, it says, the kingdom of heaven is not here, there, or somewhere. The kingdom of heaven is within you. All right, if God's kingdom is in us, then why aren't we walking and living that. Why, what is the hold up? What is the matter with you and I that we're not living? Kingdom kids. We ought to be kingdom kids. Why aren't we living like that? First of all, we spend too much time doing other things. Sitting before a beauty mirror trying to make ourselves look good. Getting our hair cut. Going and working our job. 
going doing whatever we do, go whatever we do. We're doing something other than what. But you know, you can pray in the Spirit wherever you are. You can have a virtual, united, connected presence of the Lord Jesus and the Father and the Spirit 24-7 in you right where you are all the time. They can lock your body up in the tightest cell they want to. They can put you in a straight jacket. They can put a tape across your mouth, but they can't stop your spirit from talking to God. They can't stop your thoughts from talking to God. They can't stop your emotions from talking to God. They, nothing can stop you. Nothing can separate you. Nothing can take you out of His hand. Nothing. Neither death nor life nor anything can separate. Why do you even sweat this nonsense? Why are you fretting and fussing and worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow? Why don't you get a big batch of stuff, a big cage of stuff, and put it in your backyard, get you a, get you a big a storm cellar, and fill it full of good... Get you, get you some weapons and get it ready because the end time's coming. They're going to come take it away. Let them come. When they come, tell them about Jesus. What if they shoot you? You're going to be with Jesus. You just moved out, move your resident. I'm telling you, all this fretting and worrying and, and carrying on is not for anything except the devil causing confusion and fear. Life in the Spirit is constant. It is all the time. You're never on the mountain and you're never under the mountain. Your life is is wonderfully made in the image of the Spirit. But you've got to learn to walk in it. You've got to learn to pray and walk in the Holy Spirit. If you're not, your emotions and the things you're doing and saying is going to overtake you. But if you go back to Deuteronomy, he says, when you honor God in everything you are and hope to be, then the blessings of God will overtake you. Your barns, your granaries, your corrals will all be full of the things that God wants you to have. But to, to gather that, you have to walk in the Spirit. Because the Spirit has control over the, over the natural. Now everybody wants to do good and take vitamins and be good and look perfect and all those things. And they're wonderful and you can do those things. But the point is, when you live in the Spirit and you take authority over this body. I'll give you an example. I had a friend call me and he said, I was losing so much weight I didn't know what to do. And this was a fellow that's supposed to be walking in, in the teaching of the Lord. And he was off and he was confessing the wrong thing. And he said, I asked the Lord to take over my body. And he said, I gained nine pounds in, in a week. The metabolism of his body. So if he did it, he would gain weight. He could also take weight off if you're overweight to burn up that extra poundage. So we began to walk and to speak and to act as the Spirit gives us thoughts. Now the other night, this lady right over here came and she gave a testimony. They put us on a speakerphone because of Curtis. And this, her sister had, was having seizures. And we prayed, and I was telling her down at the end of that speakerphone prayer, and I was just lying the Spirit to, to do His thing, just like He's doing it now. And, and at the end, there was a short tongue, about 30 seconds to a minute, of a spiritual language that I had never before heard. I have never prayed that. I've never heard it. Totally separate. Now, in my little understanding of things, wow, Lord, I'd like another batch of that. But it was just for that moment, just for her sister to get delivered from seizures. Praise the Lord is right, Curtis. So it was just for that moment. It was a language or words just for her sister. Now, there's been other times when the Spirit of God, one other time there was a man, that, and uh, we were praying for this guy, and he had leukemia and had it for years, and we were praying, and I had prayed this prayer in English, and he stepped away from the bed, and he says, I don't feel any better. And so the Spirit of God just encouraged me to ask him if I could pray in tongues over it. And so I went back up and re-anointed the guy, and got, had my hand on his head and was praying for him. And he says, about a minute or two into the prayer, and I don't have, know what I was saying. It was the Spirit was doing the praying. Words that, unspeakable. I mean, I was speaking them, but I didn't know the, 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 what they were. And he said, Jerry, Jesus is standing right in front of you. And I opened my eyes and his feet were right in front of my feet. As soon as he said that, those feet disappeared. The vision of it disappeared. And the guy was healed of a rare blood disease and leukemia. And, and this August was, was eight years. The eighth day of this August was, was eight years since he'd been healed. But three or four weeks ago or a month ago, I went over there and prayed for this guy. He had Crohn's disease. Now, why did that come back on him? If you don't put something in the place of what you cast out of a person, the enemy comes back and tries to take it over. So you need to be filled with the Spirit of God and the Word of God to fill that void. So if you have a loved one that gets healed of something, you need to share with them and keep them encouraged and share Galatians 4.19. Pray for them till the anointing be formed in them. Till Christ, the anointing be formed. The Word, get in there. And the enemy can't come where the Word is. Now you can go to church and go to Sunday school every week 
and hear all the good little stories, and they're wonderful, and they are, but until you start practicing that and putting it in operation in your own life, it will not become rhema to you. It will not become your lifestyle. Now, when you hear people or see people that are born-again Christians and supposed to be spirit-filled and walking with God, Jesus baptized them in the Holy Ghost, when you see that and they're not living right, they have not committed themselves to walk with God is the whole point and what is happening to them and why they tend to fall away. Now, if you go read in, in 1 Thessalonians, you're going to find that there's a great falling away. It's going to happen. Now, it looks like it's happening in our time. But we as believers ought to be coming against that one more time that there would be a great move, a great revival all across the face of the earth so people would get born again and get saved, get healed, get delivered from the bondage of religion. God is love. And God doesn't want people killing one another. And he doesn't want to put one group of people over anybody else. He loves all of them. They're all his creation. So he wants us to pray and ask the Spirit of God to hover over all these people, leaders of these terrorist group and all the leaders of these other nations, that righteousness would be the thing so that people would get saved and then the end time could come, the seven years of tribulation, etc. And it's got to come that way. But there will be a falling away, but I think it's going to happen in the tribulation. But you've got to understand, we need to stand against that thing unless God says don't. When he gives you the word, say, this is what you pray for until I change you to something else. You listen to the Spirit, he tells you how to pray. And I've been praying daily for the president and all of our leadership and the leadership of the nation that they would come to righteousness. And this jerking around and fooling around, playing golf and drinking beer and acting silly would stop and they would get right before God and walk with God and speak the things of God and we would elect righteous men and women into high places, into judgeship, Congress and everywhere else all across the world that they would come to know the Lord and this thing would turn around and, and the peace of God would rule and people would get saved. That's what I've been praying and I don't give a hoot what color the people are they're all children of God that's not the point the point is it's the spirit of the antichrist causing this turmoil and we need to stand I must close or I can go for a week Father we just thank you for the tithes and offerings that have come in to bless this ministry to take these CDs to the end of this earth and Father we thank you that your word will not return to you void but it will do the thing that it was intended that the efficacious and vicarious blood of your precious son has cleansed every person on the face of this earth regardless of where they're born or what color they are or who they are, man, woman, or child. Father, they are children of yours and we speak that blood over every one of them to bring them to a place. Holy Spirit, deal with every heart. Deal with every leader's heart, every person's heart that they would repent of their sins and relent of those things of this earth. And Holy Spirit, you take your hands off of these people. The blood covers them and you can't have them. You can't persuade them to do evil things. And we call for and we command under the name of God, the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus for the enemy to take his hands off of the people that are sick in the assisted living homes, in the old folks home, in the, in the, the, it's the place where they put them where they die, Father. We just come against all those things. And life would come forth. And those folks that are on those mountains that over there that are being transgressed because of wars, the refugees, Father, we ask you just to send your angels and send people to help, to feed those people and give them water and comfort and tell them about the Lord, irregardless of who they are. Father, we give you praise in all these things. We pray for each person that's here in this congregation that you take them, you fill them with the Spirit of God, and out of their belly will flow a river that is no ceasing to that river. And it'll always bring forth the righteousness of God. It'll always bring forth healing. It'll always bring forth deliverance. We give all these things praise and glory to you, Lord Jesus, because it's through your precious name and who you are. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Thank you for listening to the messages. And we, we just praise the Lord that you have believed and received you know, the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 8, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord and repents of their sins, that he is just and merciful to forgive you, that Jesus was beaten, he hung on the cross, he was buried, and on the third day he came out of that tomb, and he gave mankind re redemption and right re re restoration back to the Father. We thank him right now that he's blessed you and restored you. I pray that you prayed that, that prayer of faith. If you did... Call us on that number there on the bottom of the screen or email us or write us, whatever you'd like. We will, we will be glad to hear from you. 
May, your, may you send your tithes and offerings to help us get, get this message out throughout the world. We hope you're having a blessed and a prosperous day. In Jesus Christ, amen.